Welcome everybody. You are now at the program for the meeting of the week of May the 18th, 2015. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. And it's our pleasure every week to try to bring you stories of, of innovation and education and entrepreneurship and how all this relates to service. And this week we have, uh, we have a, a wildly interesting entrepreneur who, who talks about uh, kind of possibilities with water. And uh, our, our guest today is John Kaufman. He owns a Silicon Valley marketing firm. Uh, he is a member of the Peninsula Sunrise Rotary Club in Redwood City. And three and a half years ago, he joined Rotary and almost immediately began working on a very cool water-related project that you are going to hear about today. So with that, I will pass it over to John. John, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's very nice to uh, speak to the Rotary E Club of Silicon Valley. Um, I spoke to you guys maybe three and a half years ago when I launched the project, and uh, uh, I hope I'm being seen. Am I being seen? You are being seen just fine. And, awesome. and that, that presentation that you made uh, three and a half years ago was to the Rotary E Club of the Southwest USA, which oh. is a great, great Rotary Club. Um, and we are very happy here in the E Club of Silicon Valley to to have you telling us about what you're doing. Thanks for straightening that out, because you were you were the common denominator. Right. <laughs> well, um, I'll just launch into this. We don't have very much time, but I wanted to explain what H2 Open Doors is, which is a project of Rotary Clubs, and um, I'm hoping that uh, you guys would be uh, you, uh, ladies and men and children and anybody that's interested. Uh, would find it uh, an, an easy and exciting opportunity to get involved um, in really uh, moving the needle on the water issue in the world. So without further ado, I'm going to switch over to my slide presentation and uh, share that. And this is all brand new technology to me. So uh, let's see if I'm going. OK. So uh, H2 Open Doors. Um, was launched three and a half years ago um, uh, when I went to the uh, Rotary International Convention in Bangkok, and I hooked up with the uh, with the uh, district Rotary district in northern Thailand. They were telling us about a an issue that they had, and um, for a long time, maybe but even about a year before I actually joined Rotary, I learned about a technology, and there's a picture of it. Uh, this is called the Sunspring. It's made out of uh, Colorado and it's a solar and wind-powered water purification system, and I'm going to describe that a little bit. But I've gone about this kind of backwards. In other words, I don't go to a village and say, I'm going to be all things water, um, from distribution to latrines to hygiene to all that. I'm very, very um, focused, much like the way that uh, we've been successful with polio, which is only immun immunization. That's all we've done. We've done a very narrow focus on polio and kicked its butt. So the same thing with the water issue. I'm, I'm very wary about mission creep. So um, let's see if I can make the slide go. What am I doing wrong? How about now? Oh, here we go. OK. So our mantra is water education peace. That's what, that's what we're offering um, to these villages and schools. Um, and in particular with water, uh, we feel that we can solve many of the world's most uh, hard, the difficult to solve problems with a little technology and a whole lot of soul. And H2 Open Doors really only works within the context of Rotary. We have a 1.2 million man and woman army. We have 34,000 clubs in every possible region that we would want to go. There's a Rotary club there. Um, the Sunspring Hybrid is a system that can deliver 20,000 liters, or about 5,000 gallons a day, from virtually any water source. It costs about 20,000. That's a discounted price that we get from the manufacturer for rotary projects. It doesn't need any electricity or fuel. doesn't use chemical treatment. And that's really um, some of the main differences between a lot of the uh, water purification systems out there. Um, it uses membrane technology. It's a five-stage system, but the fifth stage is a membrane. It's got seven miles of membrane uh, material. That's that, that part's made by GE. It's the only system that I could find, um, after quite a bit of research, that's a decentralized water system that's this robust, that has the WQA, or the Water Quality Association gold seal, 
which means that the water that comes out of it is to the quality of US EPA standards. Um, it's uh, very simple maintenance in that you take it down for about uh, one hour to 90 minutes every month. That's all you have to do in order to do about four different various procedures that we train the villages and schools how to do when we do the installation. Um, when, when the system is in its crate and on site, whether it be wherever we've been, Guatemala or northern Thailand or wherever, um, we can get it up and running in about three hours and it's delivering pure water. It's robust, um, so it's, it's ideal for 500 to 5,000 populations. It's not good for, let's say, a village of 60 people or, or, a, or a, perhaps a, a, a center for 100 kids. Um, it's, it's not for that. It's, it puts out too much water. Its capacity is too great. So it's really, I like to think of it for 1,000 to 5,000 people, and it's manufactured in Colorado. This is what, what, what the insides look like. It's a five-stage ultrafiltration system. It, it has a, its own onboard pump. It brings the water under pressure and then into uh, 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 the housing which contains the membranes. And the only consumable is the pre-filter. If, if you see that blue uh, filter housing on the left there, um, that's a, a, a pleated spa filter and it's uh, available in every country. But in the crate, we pack about uh, four years worth of those in there. And as I said, it's about one hour of routine maintenance per month. The first, um, the first installation, as I said, was in northern Thailand. This is in February 2013 in Hawaijakan village. And we put this right by a pond that Engineers Without Borders had put together for this, uh, for this tribe of Lisu and Lahu Hill Tribe members. They had 2,500 people. And the, the pond was great, except that it was completely infested with E. coli because it's in a farming community and it's a storm drain fed pond. So we put the system in and um, are delivering, we're delivering water uh, to these 2,500 people ever since. And then we put another one in Amkoi District, which is a school of Karen Hill Tribe uh, people, 1,000 kids there. In December 2013, we responded about three weeks after the uh, the uh, typhoon, super typhoon, um, with support from the Santa Cruz Rotary um, and from uh, 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 Watsonville Rotary and as well as um, uh, Peninsula Sunrise and Redwood City Rotary. Uh, so over two districts, 5170 and 5150, uh, we responded to the Tacloban in Philippines uh, where we put in two systems, one in front of a hospital and another in a barangay. Uh, in September 2014, so not too long ago, we went to Mexico, and this was a this was a project uh, that involved uh, Vicente Fox, the former president of Mexico. Uh, Redwood City, sister city of Ciudad Guzman, we installed a system uh, and took 10 high school students from Redwood High School and Woodside High up here in the Bay Area, and two teachers, and installed a system in a community center in Ciudad Guzman. And then we spent three days over at Central Fox, which is Mr. Fox's presidential library and hacienda, and he conducted a leadership academy for the students, um, and, and actually for all of us, um, and that was September 2014. Um, this was the installation at the uh, community center, and this was all of us gathered around uh, Vicente Fox after he had addressed the kids and basically gave them a message that you were not born to be poor. You were born to do whatever you wanted to do and it was just a very empowering speech for, for these kids, most of whom happened to be Hispanic. Um, part, of the, part of the exercise was president for the day. We elected a, a president. Um, she sat at his actual desk that he used in their version of the White House. Uh, we visited the uh, water treatment facility for Ciudad Guzman so everybody could see uh, uh, the state of the water in a typical Mexican town. Um, while we were installing the system in the courtyard, the, the kids were uh, creating this incredible mural. Um, it was just an amazing day. Well, we're doing this all again in July um, of this year. Uh, the next trip was December 2014, and this was with the Santa Cruz Rotary and Watsonville Rotary Clubs in San Lucas Toloman off of Lake Atitlan. Um, uh, they're, they're, all their water in this town of about, uh, this one's about 15,000 people, all the water comes from the lake. The lake is a beautiful lake, much like Lake Tahoe, but completely dying. 
Um, it's uh, all the sewage and everything pours into the lake. It's uh, highly contaminated, um, but that's the source of all the water. We installed a system on the roof of a hospital, which I'll show you a picture of. This is the hospital. Um, there I'm standing with Bruce Clemens in the yellow shirt. Um, Bruce has been there for 45 years and is mostly responsible for bringing water to everybody through a series of pumps and distribution networks. Um, but again, none of the water can be, can be uh, consumed. It all has to be uh, boiled, rolling, rolling boiled to be safe. Um, on the roof there, now we're on the roof, we installed the Sunspring again in about three hours. And that is um, being fed the water coming up through Bruce's, um, Bruce's system from the lake. And then it's to being distributed to five roof tanks, which in turn um, are supplying all the rooms in the hospital with uh, pure, safe drinking water. And in addition, uh, we, uh, we provide water to the community at the, uh, in that courtyard. And there's um, spigots where people can just get water for free. Um, Rotary's never been known for being a first responder in da disaster relief, but the Philippines really, uh, really uh, taught us a lot. Um, so when we did respond in 2013, uh, we were pretty much on our own. Um, the Rotary Club in Tacloban had, uh, had been evacuated to Manila, so we didn't even have a Rotary partner to do this with. And, and we learned a lot, and now that we're, we're starting to gear up for some sort of a response to Tibet, um, we know not to go too soon. We, we need to wait a little bit, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But with Tacloban, um, we encountered these kinds of scenes. We were able to get a, a helicopter trip from the Romaldas family to view the devastation. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, this is a common scene where you'll see uh, ships next to houses. I mean, it was a 23-foot um, wave that sucked in and, and killed thousands of people. Um, this is what you would encounter coming down the streets. The first one we installed was at RTR Hospital, which the Romaldas family owns the hospital and the medical university and we all slept on the floors and we were there with other NGOs. This, mind you, was three weeks after the, uh, after the uh, devastation. Um, we put in the system right in front of the emergency room where it still is running today and people from all over. This was their only pure water in Tacloban at this, at this particular time. Uh, the water that was going through the pipes in the city uh, was was considered contaminated with E. coli colonies happening in all the junctures by the Philippine Health Department. So we were providing the only running water, uh, pure pure water, uh, for about a week or two in the Philippines. Yeah, uh, in Tacloban. I'm sorry, on this particular uh, in this particular town, which took the brunt of the typhoon. Uh, another uh, barangay down the road called Suhi Barangay, 1,500 residents pulling. Uh, water out of one single borehole. Downwind from them was the Suhi burial site. This was this what looks like litter off in the background is 700 bodies and body bags. Um, these were the victims, uh, some of the victims, about 10 percent of the victims of the typhoon at this point. Um, and I asked uh, what you know why are they just piled here and they said well anybody that would claim these bodies are probably already in these piles. So it was a very very moving experience. Um, this is the, uh, the, the sunspring that we put in opposite um, from the borehole, and you can see everybody's working hard to uh, break apart the concrete so that we can bring a, bring a pipe from the borehole over to the sunspring. And they use all sorts of crude, uh, crude, crude uh, um, instruments, but they really got the job done. Uh, over Easter weekend, just a few weeks ago, we went to rural Haiti uh, to a, a place called Lazy Ra. Um, the uh, over on the left, that star indicates where it is, and the star in the middle is Port-au-Prince, and it's a 14 and a half hour drive from Port-au-Prince over dirt roads and washed out roads to a community of 20,000 uh, Creole Haitians at the edge of rural Haiti. Uh, they get electricity two hours once a week. Um, they have uh, water, but it's it's got contamination, and we installed it in a courtyard of a school. Um, this is the leader of that community. His name is Windsor, and um, they are an association, kind of a town council. That's their government. And as his little daughter was sitting on his lap there while we were having uh, lunch, I asked Windsor um, how many kids under the age of five last year died in the main 
town of 2,500, and he said 50 kids died under the age of five of cholera last year. So they take very seriously the, the uh, sunspring and the solution that we brought to them. Um, this is us putting it up in the courtyard. And these are, these are now lifelong friends, the, uh, the people of, uh, of Haiti. Uh, Jack, uh, who's the inventor of the sunspring, and I were the, uh, for many of these people, and certainly all the, uh, all the people that are under 20 years old, were the only two white people they've ever seen, which was quite an experience. Um, they were taking us around uh, um, the area, the larger area, um, outside the, the main square of 2,500 people to where another 18,000 people live. And we came across a trail and we saw just a steady flow of people like this. And this young lady is carrying a five-gallon bucket on her head. It's kind of the classic scene that you would see in a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, NGO uh, documentaries and so on. And I asked her, um, how far she has to go to get the water, where's the water point? She said, well, it's up that trail, and I don't know how far it is, but it takes me two and a half hours each way. Um, so, you know, we thought, well, that was amazing. And then um, we, we walked a little bit more, and uh, my host, Harry, uh, was just mentioning the, the fauna and flora in the area, and he was pointing out to these banana trees, and he said, these particular banana trees have very, very long, deep roots, and they only exist if they're on top of a uh, aquifer or, so, or a big body of water. And I said, okay, let me get this straight. These trees are huge. They're gigantic. Um, these people are walking five hours a day to get water up, up the trail. What would it cost to just dig down here and, and create a well right here where we're at? Because we know there's water down there. And they thought about it and they talked about it and they came back and they said, well, they call me Fada. You know, I'm, I'm Fada. They said, Fada, you've done way too much for us, and Rotary has been so kind. Um, it's too expensive. I said, well, how much? And they said, 1,200 U.S. dollars. So this is why working in the third world and doing what we do is so addictive, why you can't get enough, because it's so easy to solve their problems. So that's the next project that's happening in the next month or so, is they're going to be digging the well, um, getting a source. They're going to test the water at a lab. And if the water is good, we won't need to bring in sunspring. But if we do, um, we will. But if it's good water, then um, they said that the most people would have to walk to this particular water point for 5,000 of them uh, would be 15 minutes. So immediately changing their lives. The sunspring also uh, uh, offers an opportunity for a social business. And the name H2 Open Doors connotes that we're more than just about water projects. It's really about open doors or opportunity. Um, in uh, in uh, Thailand, that was the first one that we, that we did. We set up a women's water council with the host Rotary Club there. If they were to sell the, the one-third, uh, if they were sell, to sell one-half of the surplus water at one-third the going rate that, they're buy, that they were buying bottled water for, so I'm sorry, if they just used 25% of the daily capacity, of the sunspring and sold it at, at 13 cents per liter, which is one third the rate. Or in other words, if they were able to sell 4,250 liters every day, they would earn $552 per day. That's $201,000 per year, which is completely transformative for that village. The amount of money that people spend when they're living on a dollar, dollar fifty, two dollars a day, they're spending about 25 to 50 percent of their income on bottled water. So it's not so much that they don't have access to water. They, don't, they can't afford the water that they do have access to. And then you have the plastic water bottle problem, which I won't even get into. Our local high schools are involved because it's, it becomes part of their curriculum. And we choose the best performers, typically, particularly in Redwood, uh, Redwood High School or in Woodside High, there are environmental classes. And they study the village that we're about to go to. And then they, um, they do uh, an essay, and then the teacher chooses which eight to ten kids would go. Um, we, uh, the Rotary Club, uh, part of the money that we raise uh, finances them going, about $1,000 per kid. The trip that we're taking to Mexico uh, in July will take 12 students and two teachers, and we're paying for, um, for that trip and housing, and including the visit to Central Fox. So H2 Open Doors is a project of Rotary Clubs. It's intended to be replicated by other clubs. Um, we're not trying to build an empire here. Um, it's about water and opportunity. 
we try to use the best technology available and our philosophy and there's different philosophies our philosophy is to help the largest number of people at the lowest cost per beneficiary so let's do some math about that and this is why we don't drill or do wells because this is there's no, there is nothing in the water business or the water space that is um, less expensive because of the robust nature and the number of people that we can serve so let's consider that one sunspring serves 1,000 to 5,000 people and it gives them water every day for at least 10 years well how much it'll give them two liters or a half a gallon of drinking water every single day and if you think about how much water you're actually drinking um, you'd be hard-pressed to drink a half a gallon but that's that's how we that's how we monetize this the sunscreen would cost with shipping figure twenty three thousand dollars so by by producing ten thousand liters per day which is just half of its capacity it can do twenty thousand liters per day um, that produces 3.6 million, a little over 3.6 million liters per year. So that is six tenths of a penny per liter over one year. And over the 10 year uh, uh, design life of the membranes, that's six one hundredths of a penny per liter over 10 years. There is no solution in the water space that gives that kind of economy. So that's what we're all about. And so. Um, when we can empower a community to then turn around and sell the surplus capacity, in other words, the, the water that they're not using for their own purposes, and sell it for even one-tenth of what they're currently buying it for, it's a tremendous opportunity. In Mexico, um, the typical cost for a liter of water is 10 pesos, or 70 cents. If they sold it for one pesos, or 7 cents, and they sold half the capacity, they're looking at twenty thousand US dollars a month or almost a quarter of a million dollars a year in revenue all that money going back to the charitable works that the town or the village or the organization that's sponsoring the Sunspring um, is is uh, budgeting a thousand beneficiaries the cost per beneficiary per year therefore is forty six cents per person per year it's very little solutions that provide this kind of economy and again, that's providing two liters or half a gallon of safe, pure drinking water every day. The projects that we've got lined up um, are uh, El Salvador in 2015, Ecuador, Mexico, Guatemala, India, and N Nepal, which I didn't have time to add to the screen. Um, we're going to try to start a fund for Nepal in particular in about a month or two as soon as we have some information and intelligence on the ground about exactly where we're going to put it, the source of the raw water, and so forth. We also want to um, uh, raise enough money to have five sun springs for this kind of immediate disaster. Um, we have lots of sources where we can get shipments for disaster relief um, for free on C-130s and so on, um, but we need to have the sun springs built in on the shelf. So this is a project of H2 Open Doors. It's a project of Peninsula uh, Rotary, but it's meant to be replicated um, throughout Rotary. I'm going to Sao Paulo um, to the Rotary International Convention in the House of Friendship. I'll be displaying the Sun Spring. I'll be speaking to Rotarians from all over the world, and I'm trying to uh, get people to understand that there is the possibility of solving water for thousands of people um, for a very, very uh, low amount of money couple of clubs, couple of three clubs could combine together with even their leftover DDF funds and pull this off. My website is h2opendoors.org. There's tons of content there. And I just want to thank the club for your attention. And I look forward to talking to you individually by, uh, and answering your emails. I can be reached at john at h2opendoors.org. So Rushton, that's it. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Very, very cool stuff. Well, l let's hear it for John. <laughs> hey, no, wonderful, wonderful work. I, we, you know, it's exciting to see this kind of stuff happen well, along several fronts. You know, I mean, uh, you know, especially understanding the the mechanics of it in terms of cost per person. You know, several slides you mentioned the two liters per day, and and I believe that's that's two liters per person per day, and, and as as you factor all these things out, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, to, in other words, a, a sunspring can do can provide for ten, as many as ten thousand people, 
it can provide two liters per day because it's 20,000 liters per day capacity from really any, any, um, any raw water source. It removes all the bacteria and viruses with the membranes and allows some of the vital nutrients to get through so it's not reverse osmosis. Hmm. But it's uh, it's it, it the water that comes out is guaranteed to be to the quality that you get in your tap at your house. Very nice. Well, I, I love that there's an educational component to it as well. You know, getting the the high school students involved. You know, kind of studying what's happening, even taking a group like you're going to be doing uh, this summer. You know, down to Mexico, and, and that's wonderful that you're you're partnering with uh, President Fox or ex President Fox in. in uh, in Mexico, what a, what an incredible experience for the the students to be able to not just kind of get a sense of the the possibilities, you know, when people get together and decide to make something happen, but also to connect with you know a world leader at the same time. Well, absolutely, and this is the opportunity side of it. As a matter of fact, the project that he's that that he's partnering on us in Mexico, he's given us twelve thousand five hundred dollars, which is basically half the cost of a sunspring. And the reason why he's doing it is. His foundation just acquired Vamos Mexico, which is another foundation, which has within it, at San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, a rehabilitation center for disabled children. And it was at, the, it was at risk of closing down because the founder had died and they were losing funds. Hmm. And all of a sudden, so he, he took it over to try to save it because it does tremendous work. And so the idea is that this will be a pure revenue model. They're going to sell the purified water that they're that we're going to be pumping out of the river and they're going to be selling the purified water to and there's about 10,000 Americans that live in San Miguel um, and all the money collected and this will be about twenty thousand um, dollars per per month will go towards um, the finances of running Chrisma which is this um, rehabilitation center that's fantastic all right I want to want to also introduce um, our, our, our guest that we've got with us today as well uh, those of you who've been with us the last few weeks will remember two weeks ago, as of our posting this anyway, uh, the presentation on the Sister City program between Santa Cruz and Kasesi, Uganda. And uh, Peggy Pollard is with us. And Peggy, if you have a question, we, we'd love to hear it. Uh, John will also get you to stop sharing the slide there, too. Bring, you, br bring your mug back on as well. All right. Let's see. Uh, how do I do that? Oh, take off screen share, right? Uh, yeah, it'll say stop sharing stop or sharing. something like that. Right. Got it. Okay. Peggy, you're, you're up. Okay, great. Hey, John and Rush, and thank you so much. This is fascinating, exciting, world changing. And I have a lot of questions. Just, it's such a doable thing. I love a bargain. My mom raised me to be a bargain shopper. So, 46 cents a person per year to get clean water is amazing. Why is, is this new technology? Why is it just getting started? And, you know, I'm kind of, what, what are the barriers that you're seeing so far, maybe cultural barriers in the places you've already brought this clean water to? So maybe just start with, where, um, has this technology just come out? Has it been a long time? How did you just discover it? Uh, the technology itself, well, the basic technology of membranes has been around for about 20 years, and a lot of the uh, huge water treatment facilities, um, Palo Alto and uh, Mountain View, use membranes, huge membranes. That, this is how they purify the water uh, to send through the pipes. Um, what uh, this guy Jack Barker did in, at Innovative Water Technologies in Colorado that I discovered was he figured out a way to miniaturize this concept. And so um, in a solar, wind-powered, no chemical water treatment facility for thousands of people that can do that that kind of that was that was the genius of it but um, he started building those probably about eight years ago and the 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 largest um, uh, distribution of them have been in Haiti where there's about 50 systems in Haiti right after uh, in 2010 right after the earthquake um, the Clinton Foundation bought about half of them and I think World Vision uh, bought the other half and they they, they installed right away and so they've been running since uh, since 2010. Um, the cultural barriers are interesting. It's really not so much about um, the pure water. Everybody gets, you know, they're, they're, they, they need pure water. They're, they're desperate for it. It's when we try to um, make it a revenue model. That's the difficult part. You know, your club, Peggy, Santa Cruz, you know, we all went on the uh, excursion, the expedition to uh, Guatemala over um, New Year's. 
what a blast that was. Um, but trying to convince the Mayan people that they can now sell the water is very difficult. They, they don't really understand it, even though they understand that they're currently buying bottled water, <laughs> you know, and they're spending about 25% of what everybody earns on bottled water, that the, that money goes to Nestle and Coca-Cola, um, they, they, they're having a hard time understanding that on the roof of the hospital is a money machine, that if that water is made more available to the people, they could actually sell it and then have all the money they need for all sorts of other social services. And they could be selling the water at one-tenth the cost of what Coca-Cola and Nestle and the other uh, tributaries of those companies um, are, are selling it for. So culturally, it's the going into the business. And this is why it works best in the context of Rotary, because everywhere we want to go, there's a Rotary Club that, that is there when we leave. And these are the people that provide what I call the three M's. They mentor the village or the school on how to possibly monetize and start a social business. They monitor the use of the equipment and the regular maintenance. And then they also provide some microfinancing. You know, maybe a village needs some bottles or they need some uh, 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 power washing equipment to clean the bottles or that kind of thing. They'll provide the kind of uh, ancillary uh, uh, money for that. So Rotary is absolutely key. I don't think this works without uh, the context of Rotary because of the cultures of the communities. Very, very cool stuff. I, I know, uh, Peggy, you've got a, a long list of questions there. Um, but uh, just for keeping to our time, if, if you want to toss in one more, and uh, John, you can answer that one, and then I'll wind things up. Okay. John, what would you say are the requirements for a place to be ready for this system? You say having a Rotary Club that's active, what, what, what would be the criteria you'd look at to say, where's the next place we want to put this with, through Rotary? Very good. Yeah, usually I like to have a Rotary Club, not, not so much um, uh, for global grants or, or grant purposes because, as a matter of fact, this is less than a global grant. You know, the cost for this, it's 20000 Minimum global grant would be 30000 but, um, but mostly because I want a responsible group of adults uh, that I can communicate with uh, throughout the 10-year lifespan of the membranes. Um, uh, so I, wanna, I want a good, viable Rotary Club. But but half the time, it's not available. There's no Rotary Club there, or they're dysfunctional, or whatever. But that's that's our first choice, is to have a Rotary partner. The second thing is we, we there's a series of things that we do. We want to, uh, before we even go there to do a site analysis, we want a water analysis. So we want them to take a sample of the raw water, bring it to a lab, and send us the report so we can see the nature of the contaminant and see if we can help. I mean. Pretty much everything uh, uh, can be treated, and we can set up the sunspring to handle any contaminant, but we want to know before we, we make the commitment. Um, second is we want to know uh, the actual site, and, and is the water 24-7? You know, we can't, it doesn't make water, it just purifies water. So there needs to be a source of water that won't dry out during the dry times. Um, it, may, it may mean in certain climates where uh, you have a dry season that we have to tank the water, the, you know, the raw water. Maybe it has to be in com combination with a rainwater harvesting project. Um, there's lots of different ways, but we can't starve the system of water. We need to have 365 days access uh, to water. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, capabilities that we can do. And the Sunspring um, also is, a, is an opportunity to be able to hook it into buildings and have running water through buildings. So we want to be able to know what are the opportunities for that to bring water, make it the most convenient to the most number of people. So all those kinds of things are in our analysis before we actually um, do anything. Wow, very cool. I mean, John, you're, you're a fantastic example of, you know, I think what, what Rotarians strive to be. You know, somebody who, who comes in, who sees an opportunity, sees a need that needs to be filled, uh, you know, looks around and says, you know, can, can we make this happen as a group? And then, bam, you know, suddenly, you know, there's momentum and, you know, cool things happen. So thank you so much for, for the work you're doing. That's, it's tremendous. Thank you, uh, Thank you, yeah. Peggy. Peggy, thank you for joining in as well. Uh, to all of our viewers, uh, it, is, it is a pleasure having you be a part of this. Uh, John, I don't know if you'll have time, but during the week of the 18th, from, from Monday the 18th through uh, Sunday the 24th, uh, we'll have people all through that week, uh, 
taking a look at, at the, the meeting and watching the program and leaving comments at the bottom. And so you're welcome to, to kick in and you know respond to any comments people have. Uh, you can see how that happened uh, in, in previous week's meetings. Uh, it's wonderful to see those kinds of discussions take place. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, thank you again so much. And thank you, Club, and for all that you guys do. All right, awesome. So for all of you viewers, uh, there are still two things you need to do to make sure you properly finish off this meeting. Uh, there is an I attended survey just below, uh, not far, you know, kind of below this, this particular window in, in which you're watching the video. Uh, and you need to fill that out if you're one of our members so that we can give you credit for attending. Uh, and if you are one of our guest Rotarians, then you fill that out in order to have an email sent to you that you can then turn around to your secretary for a makeup meeting. And we, we love being able to provide makeup opportunities for Rotarians 24-7. So we think that's a cool thing we do. Um, also, make sure to leave a comment in the system below. So the, the discuss, discuss system uh, down at the bottom uh, is, is a place where you can uh, leave a comment or respond to other people's comments. And we, we like having that conversation happen around the stories of, of service and innovation that we share as a part of our club. You can find us here all the time at Rotary. Uh, at, at, at the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Our address is siliconvalleyrotary.com or rotarymakeup.org, all one word. So with that, uh, I hope that we will see you again next week. We thank you for taking a little time to spend with us, and we hope that you will make some great things happen in your community this week as well. Thanks again for coming. Um.